Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Uh, tonight, we're very lucky to be joined by Frank Machi, who's a uh, principal investigator here at the SETI Institute. Frank did his uh, master's and PhD at the uh, University uh, uh, Paul Sabatier in Toulouse. Uh, he, his topic was uh, the study of Io's volcanism and uh, using adaptive optics techniques. And he came across to the States uh, to do a postdoc at UC Berkeley, uh, which was uh, uh, on adaptive optics for planetary sciences. Uh, and then he uh, joined the Carl Sagan Center um, uh, just a few years ago, uh, about five years ago. And uh, <coughs> he's also the organizer of our uh, uh, blogs on Cosmic Diary. Uh, and uh, he blogs as, uh, sorry, he tweets as all planets. Um, and uh, he also organises our SETI chat series, which is a half-hour videos on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, where he interviews uh, scientists about their work um, in a very approachable sort of manner for the non-scientist. Frank uh, was the recipient of a uh, Professor Henri Schutzreiten grant in two th 2004, and uh, asteroid 6639 Marchi is named in his honour. His career has focused around uh, multiplicity of small solar system bodies. Uh, he uh, published a paper on the discovery of uh, the triple system 87 cilia, uh, and he's very interested in uh, Trojan swarms of asteroids and uh, the figures of binary asteroids, which we're finding uh, many more uh, as we look out in the solar system. He's the uh, leader of the International Outer Planet Watch, He's a member of the Gemini Planet Imager team, uh, which will soon go online, that's GPI. Uh, and uh, he's also uh, a part of the Next Generation uh, Keck uh, investigations, as I'm sure that we're gonna hear about in his talk today. Um, so please join me in welcoming Frank. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you for this uh, introduction. Thanks for attending and being here. So, so I'm going to give this talk, which is basically um, a walk through history. And I'm going to show you how we improve the quality of uh, imaging uh, using ground-based telescopes, optical ground-based telescopes. So basically, I entitled, entitled this Breaking Through the Seeing Barrier in Planetary Astronomy. So I have your undivided attention right now. So we're going to start with the boring part of my talk which is basically this line, this line of text here. So as I say, we are, it's a walkthrough, okay? They are, I decided to show the evolution in planetary astronomy from the antiquity all the way to the future, ex assuming that I can, I can predict the future. So I'm talking about planetary science. And planetary science basically consists of the study of the solar system bodies, but also includes since two 2008, the study of extra extrasolar planets, exoplanets planets around other stars. So remember that I'm talking about optical telescopes, and optical telescopes act, like, act basically like a bucket of light. The bigger is the aperture of the telescope, the more light you receive, so the fainter the target you can see. But after a telescope, what you need is a detector. A detector could be your eyes, could be a CCD camera, could be a, any other kind of detectors. And what they do, they collect the photons. And these photons come from this body, which are billions of uh, light years away from us, in the case of galaxies, of uh, a few hundred uni uh, astronomical units in the case of transneptunian objects. What we do, we analyze this light, we analyze these photons, we, cap we receive them with a telescope, and from the photons, we estimate basically, from the light coming from these photons, we can estimate the temperature, the composition of the bodies. So, as I say, the, lar the larger the telescope is, the more light you can receive. But the larger is, is the telescope, the more details you can see on the surface of a body. This is true only if the telescope is in space. If the telescope is on the surface of a planet like Earth, between the Jupiter, for instance, and the observer, we have what we call the Earth's atmosphere. The Earth's Earth atmosphere is uh, useful for us because it, it allows us to breathe, but it also distort the light coming from these planets. So because of this, of this distortion, the final effect is the twinkling of the star or the blurring of the image. 
So when we observe from, with a ground-based telescope, we never very really use the full potential of a telescope, of the large aperture telescope, in the normal condition. So what, what we call this effect, that we, the blurring of light, we quantify it using what we call the seeing. The seeing is the quality of the sky. The lower is the seeing, the better is the sky. Typically, the seeing from uh, mountain view is a few, uh, is five to seven arc seconds. The seeing from the top of a mountain, like leak observatories, between one and two arc seconds. So that's all. That's all for the text. Let's go through the through the talk himself, itself. So people have been asking a lot when I would give these talks, why you work? Why do you work at the SETI Institute? What is as planetary astronomy and those telescopes has, has to do with uh, the SETI Institute. So I remember that five years ago when I arrived uh, here, I wanted basically to work at the SETI Institute. I had an interview with Frank Drake at this time. And Frank sat in front of me. That was my first and only uh, job interview. And he, <laughs> and he asked me, so Frank, or should I say Frank, because at this time I have Frank. <laughs> and I said, yes, Frank. Could you tell me in what your research will be useful for understanding or constraining the parameter of the Drake equation? So uh, we went through the parameters and I basically showed that my research, my work, will basically help to detect exoplanets, detect exoplanets which could support arbor life, detect sign of, uh, of life on this exoplanet, and maybe even sign of intelligence life. This is, of course, in the future, yes? Back to the first slide for just one second. So the last um, bullet and then the third from the bottom, is that saying that a telescope in space has about 20 times the resolution of a telescope uh, on the top of a mountain? The telescope in space has a resolution which is typically equal to lambda over d. So it's roughly uh, 30, uh, 30 milli arc seconds in the case of a Keck telescope if you were in space. And in fact, the Keck telescope, if it doesn't have any adaptive optics I'm going to talk about, will have a resolution of 0.6 arc seconds only. The a, in that particular circumstance, 20x difference, 20 yeah. times difference. So basically, the Keck telescope will act with the same resolution power than a 20 centimeter telescope. OK? okay? Sorry. OK. So let's keep this. So that, that's the story of how I came here. OK. So we all love planetary science. Everybody loves planetary science. You love planetary science because I'm sure you remember the first time you looked through a telescope and you saw Saturn or Jupiter and the moons, the moon of Jupiter. This is what people remember the most when they have this experience of looking through a telescope. This started a long time ago. It started with Galileo Galilei in 1609. The first observation Galileo, Galileo made is, in fact, planetary science observation. He observed, I'm going to talk about that, solar system body specifically. Telescopes has been used by planetary astronomers over the 400 years to basically understand the solar system, understand the variability of phenomena such as the atmosphere, the weather on Titan, the change on the surface of Io, but also to understand the short time scale events which are unpredictable. And those are, for instance, the impact of a comet on Jupiter, which has been seen various times now. The public has a strong interest in planetary science. They relate to it somehow. Because if I tell you Jupiter, you know what Jupiter looks like. If I tell you Saturn, you know Saturn has a ring. But if I tell you Gliese 5871, or if I tell you galaxy red, Redshift Z equal 5, you have no idea. You don't know, you can't perceive the distance, OK? And we have this, planetary scientists are lucky in a way that we can explain to you what what's we are doing, and you understand it. And sometimes this understanding goes through patience. And one of these is two examples I have here. This is the puppet that was uh, for sale in Japan when the, mission, the JAXA mission launched the, Akatsu, uh, J the JAXA Space Agency launched the mission Akatsuki, which was the first mission which will orbit, we were supposed to orbit the Vi Venus, planet Venus from the Japanese uh, space agency. And on the right, you have the equivalent, the US version of the interest, which is basically the protest we had in 2006 when Pluto was demoted. Yeah. <laughs> These are the, 
You can see if you can read the sign, but there is people holding signs that says Pluto is not a rock. <laughs> okay, Pluto is still a planet. So this is a walkthrough. So let's go through the classical an antiquity first. Remember that in this time they didn't have telescopes. So basically, what they could see is only what the naked eyes could could see in the sky. So the Greek classified the bodies uh, in the sky in different categories. First, they called these moving point planets, wanderer. They detected five of them, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And they call luminarias everything which is big, like the moon and the and sun. Hipparchos made this first catalog of 850 stars. He made this first catalog to basically show that in the sky we have this moving wanderer, but you also the, have these fixed bodies, those stars, those 850 stars. But then there was some event, some unexpected event, unpredictable, some dot which was grow appearing suddenly in the sky, growing and having shape and size. Those are comets. And these are examples of how comets has been frightening for the people before we really understand what they, were where, what they really was, really were. So this is an example we have here, the Halley uh, comet on the Bayeux Tapestry. This is the first comics Ever, ever, done, ever made by humans. And he relate basically how the Norman conquered England. And on this, co on this tapestry, you can see a comet Ali, which was a bad omen at the time. When the comet appeared, it was a sign that some, somehow uh, something disastrous will happen. And that's the death of the, the king of England. On the right, we have this another example with the, an Aztec painting showing the emperor, the last emperor of the Aztec, Montezuma, observing a comet, basically leading to the end of, this, of uh, this, their civilization. Then 400 years ago, we invented the telescope, the optical telescopes. So I found out that telescopes come from telescopos, preparing this talk, which means far-seeing. It's a name which was uh, basically coined in 1610 by a Greek uh, mathematician. So the first telescope were what we call refractor telescope. They were made of lenses. The problem of those lenses that suffer uh, chromatic aberration. If you look through this uh, uh, refracting telescope, you can if you look at your star, you will see the star, but you will see also a kind of a rainbow around it. Those are aberrations. This is not coming from the star. These are coming from uh, imperfection in the telescope. Galileo Galilei heard about this invention by the Dutch and basically built his own telescope. In this time, he called, in his book called Siderius Nuncius, he called this Perspicillium. And his, when, he f the, when he built his first telescope, his first idea was, of course, to observe the moving target in the sky. <coughs> and he discovered that uh, the moon was not perfec perfect, the surface of the moon was, was not perfect. He reported the presence of craters and hills. He reported the presence of, uh, that you can see here on this, on this uh, drawing, the presence of the moon around Jupiter, the Galilean moon. He also, he also found out that Saturn was not a perfectly circ circular. Sat Saturn, re he reported as some kind of ears. And that we found out later that those, those were, in fact, rings. So after this invention, of course, quickly uh, uh, astronomers found that it was, a very, it was a perfect instrument to, un to understand the events. So they developed different kind of technology. And they wanted to get rid of this chromatic aberration I mentioned to you. And this is one of the most imaginative uh, instruments they, they are made. It's called Ariel Telescope. So it's basically a very long telescope with a long focal. focal. So you have on the top, you have the, the, the lens here. And on the, on the bottom, you have the eyepiece. So the observer was using, was trying to adjust the eyepiece in a way that he could see through, through the lens. Uh, this was not easy. Most likely, the, a lot of people try, and a few, uh, a very few succeed. Succeeded, but the point, the main point here is that even with those instruments, with they improved the image quality to the point they were capable of observing and seeing moons around Saturn. The second main the, another main discovery is, of course, the discovery of asteroids. So this was made by uh, Giuseppe Piazzi in 1801. At this time, they were looking for the missing planet, the planet between Mars and Jupiter, because this uh, uh, Titus body, body equation, or law, 
was basically telling them that there should be a planet there. So Giuseppe Piazzi found this uh, new star, moving star, this, and he reported in this table. And a, few, a year later, uh, Olbers found another, new, another star that, uh, that now we call Pallas. And in fact, it's a few years later that uh, we found out that the, the solar system was composed of those ma major planets, and we have a, a large number of small bodies that we now call asteroids. Another discovery, important discovery made with uh, uh, telescopes is, of course, the discovery of, uh, of the planet Uranus. This was made, uh, that's one of the reasons I'm talking about that. This was discovery was made by Herschel, but he used, not, uh, he, he used in this case, a reflecting telescopes. He used what uh, uh, Newton uh, developed in 1608, but he improved the technology. Uh, if you read the... Um, his, his, uh, his uh, books, we found out that in fact he, he did by himself the polishing of the mirror. Herschel was um, a musician by formation. Then he became interesting to, the, to, the math to mathematics, and then he became, he became astronomer. So he was very talented. He knew how to craft objects and make it, um, and make it um, efficient. So that's the reason he, he, he managed to develop this 16-centimeter uh, reflecting telescopes. So through the discovery of Uranus, the secondary product was the discovery of Neptune due to the perturbation of, uh, of Neptune on the orbit of Uranus. When two, I'm not going to go through this, the details, but basically two theorists, because now became the theorists, Le Verrier and Adam, one in France, one in England, predicted basically the position of another planet now called Neptune. And it's in fact uh, an, an observer in Berlin uh, Joan Gall, which basically discovered for the first time the, pr the, pr the planet Neptune. So we're coming closer to us now with the, second, so the astronomy after the second, revolution, second Industrial Revolution. So as I mentioned, I mentioned to you that astronomers were using all these different kind of telescopes with aperture varying from a few centimeters to 20 centimeters refract, refract, refractors or ref, uh, reflector telescopes. But in fact, Isaac Newton clearly identified that there was a main issue with those telescopes, and is, uh, with those observations. So it's not in fact coming from the telescope, but by the fact that there was an atmosphere. And he basically reported that in his book, Optics. So the solution is to get rid of the atmosphere. But at this time, we could not go to space. So the way to minimize this effect is to build, to build observatories on the top of high mountains. This was possible thanks to the, secondary, the, the industrial revolution because of the improvement of the transportation and, manufact and manufacture, of course. And that's the way uh, observatories like Leak Observatory that you can see not too far away from here, Lowell and Peak du Midi was built. Was built. So this image shows here the presence, of the, the construction of the Leak Observatory. On the right, you have the, the Crossley Telescope, which is a very old telescope and the first one which was designed to use astro astrophotography. And this one is the, the Pic du Midi. And the reason I show you this picture is one of the reasons for which I become astronomer, is because I was a guide uh, at the museum of the Pic du Midi, which was the, the observatory too close to Toulouse. So using this, um, <coughs> using this uh, new, new telescopes on the top of mountains, we get a better seeing between one and two arc seconds, so we could see better, we could see details on the surface of planets. The morphology of Mars, of the Moon, the clouds on, on Venus. We could also see fainter and smaller objects, such as asteroids. Asteroid, the discovery of asteroids increased significantly, or, or, or moons. So as I say, I mentioned telescopes, how useful they are, but the second most important part of uh, this is, of course, the instrumentation, the detector. So before 1900, we basically, an, an astronomer was also a very a, a good artist. He was capable of drawing, painting what he was observing through the telescope because we were using our eyes either as a detector. So this is a, uh, a drawing of Jupiter from this time. Interestingly, we still use those drawings to understand, for instance, the variation of color of the band and belt of Jupiter. These drawings are nice, but they're not very accurate. Most of the time, 
because we are human after all, we kind of put some details which are not real in the painting, or we have the tendency to connect dots that, that when there is none, in fact, no connections. And they also are not very sensitive because our eye is small. The pupil of our eyes is a few millimeter. And we don't have photometric information. We don't have, we don't have a way to quantify the amount of light coming from, from this, um, this uh, coming from these bodies. Photography changed significantly astronomy by providing a better sensitivity because we could integrate over a long period of time, so get more photons. We were also capable of sharing and duplicate this observation. I also discovered that um, um, the third part here is the, the infrared spectroscopy. This is something I basically uh, I looked for a few, a few days ago. It was kind of interesting to find out when was the first time we collected a, a spectra of Jupiter. And this was done by Kuiper in 1947. Um, the German army during the war uh, developed this kind of new detector mix of lead and sulfide mm. to be capable of detecting uh, the signature of hot missiles coming from, uh, from the west. And this, this uh, technology came to the end of uh, astronomers and they basically used this detector to, to capable of detecting uh, near-infrared photons to observe, uh, to observe bodies in the solar system. So what you have on the, on the slide here is the first spectra of Jupiter in the near-infrared between 0 0.7 micron and 2 micron. And the, 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 what you can see here, the absorption band of methane, speci uh, more specifically. So astrophotography astro astro also changed radically, as I say, uh, the world of astronomy by providing data that we could share. And these are the first, in fact, one of the first uh, photography of a body, uh, of a solar system body. That's the comet Ali, uh, the, when he made this close passage in 1910. So something you don't see here, this is a detail of the coma, okay, which uh, changed shape and size. And here, this is basically the, s the, the <laughs> comet when it passed nearby. And it was extended up to 10 degrees. So it was a remarkable event for, for, this, pe for, for this period of time. So I, can talk about uh, I cannot talk about planetary science without talking about space mission. I know it's not the goal of this talk, but it's always important to know what the competition is doing. <laughs> or what's basically what's can we don't call ourselves competitors anymore but we learn a lot from space mission and space mission learn a lot for a lot from uh, from uh, uh, planetary astronomy so this uh, this is a figure that i stole from uh, national geographic showing 200 the trajectory of 200 missions which explore different bodies in the solar system the first one launch was ma uh, mars part of the mars 1m program and was launched by the Soviets uh, in 1960. But in fact, most of the mission was sent to visit the inner part of the solar system because it's closer to us. So these are the, uh, the missions sent around uh, the moon, Venus, Mars, and so on. Let me skip this. Very few missions explore the outer part of the solar system. Very few missions, uh, we have very few in situ data of planets such as Neptune Uranu and Uranus. So this is a few of them. I remind you that uh, from 1993 to 2000, we had a mission in orbit around Jupiter called the, the Galileo spacecraft. I'm going to go back to that. We have currently a mission in orbit around uh, Saturn, the NASA, Cassini, uh, the NASA Cassini mission, which is collecting data of the planet Saturn, the rings, but also its, uh, its moons. And we have now mission in orbit around asteroids. Uh, the, NASA, the NASA mission Dawn just left Vesta and is currently en route uh, towards Ceres, a dwarf planet. So space missions are remarkable because they provide high angular resolution images. You can see details that you will not be capable of seeing with a, with a telescope. We see details but up to a few meters in size on the surface of Mars, for instance. We can even see activities change on the surface due to some geological effect. Also, space missions take in situ data. They get rid of this blurring from the Earth's atmosphere 
but they are also capable of uh, uh, having equipment, in detectors, which give, us, give them access to a broader wavelength range. So we're not limited only to visible and near infrared or mid -inf and a few windows in the mid infrared, like we have right with uh, ground based telescopes. We can observe, observe in X ray and also in the millimeter range. These are important because, based on this detector, we can also have access to different kind of transition and have, different, uh, have a better understanding of the composition of the atmosphere of a planet, for instance. But with the prawns, con the cons, and, and, and vice versa. Space missions are extremely expensive. They cost, for the lowest price, $450 million in the case of the NASA Discovery mission. They're extremely long to, be, to, to, to develop. It takes 15 years, 10 to 15 years, to develop a large space mission. So most of the time, when the space mission reaches the, the, the target, the technology is already desert, obsolete. And space missions are generally dedicated to only one kind of target. Remember, with a, sp with, a, with a telescope, you can point the telescope everywhere you want, so you can observe different planets. You can observe uh, all the planets of the, so of the solar system if they are visible. So one solution is to launch well, a space telescope. And that's, I think, the gem of the, of the NASA ESA program, is basically the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, it's a 2.4 meter class telescope, so that's the size of the aperture, in orbit around Earth. It costs a fortune to develop and also to, uh, to manage. He has a very interesting life. I'm not going to go through that in detail, but he was, he was launched already 23 years ago. And thanks to different uh, um, service mission, astronauts went there and basically was, were, were capable of changing instrument. So you have diff a suite of instruments. Some was dismounted, replaced, and so on. We even improved the capability of the, of the space telescope by uh, giving him some lens due to uh, some issue with the primary mirror. So the Hubble Space Telescope is still in orbit around, around Earth 23 years later, and it's still one of the most uh, requested uh, uh, telescopes in the world. It's very, ex I mean, it's, what I meant is that it's very difficult to get time on these telescopes. I got time once in my life. Um, the mission, unfortunately, the mission is now uh, ending. At the end, we don't know when it's going to happen, but it's expected that in 2018, the space, the, the, there will be no, no possibility to, to uh, communicate with the space, or at least to point the space telescope wherever we want. So we need to find a replacement. So this is uh, a few images of the space telescope. I'm sure you have seen those. Uh, it's been used to observe all body in the solar system. We have Mars and Venus on the left here. You have the, um, the scar of a collision by a comet on the, on the, in the atmosphere of Jupiter. You have here Saturn and satellite and Titan transiting. Uh, using the space telescope, being capable of observing details on the surface of Uranus and see, for instance, a black spot, which was, which was not seen by the Voyager mission. Uh, we also have even some data on the, some on the surface of Pluto. We will see if, uh, if this is real as soon the new horizon uh, reaches Pluto in, in two years. These are the observations of Vesta, the, uh, the asteroid Vesta number four. And we can see that it's a very colorful body, irregular in shape. Now we have better data, but those HST data have been extremely useful to constrain the, the Dawn mission since we knew the size of Vesta before Dawn arrived there. And we also have seen some unexpected, some stuff that we were not expecting and we still don't really understand. This is a comet-like asteroid. We think that it's, a com it's an asteroid which has been impacted and what we can see is fragments. Uh, still, this is still uh, debatable, of course. And very recently, and this is a SETI Institute uh, result by Mark Showalter, um, using the Space Telescope, Mark and his team detected the presence of a new satellite around Neptune that you can see here with a beautiful name of S2004N1. Okay, so let's go to what I'm doing. What I've been doing, in fact. This could be a picture of me doing my PhD. <laughs> this is a 3.6 meter telescope by, uh, in Chile at La Silla. So I arrived in 1996 at La Silla by, um, 
when the first adaptive optic system was installed on these telescopes. He was the first one, he was a prototype, and as all prototypes, that he was not really working well. So I was spending most of my nights climbing on the top of the telescope while the observer were doing the observations, like, a, like this, through this tiny hole and trying to set up the system and trying to make it work for the stress astronomer who had traveled all the way from Europe to Chile to get five minutes of observation. <laughs> and this is a slide that I had in my, I also presented in my thesis. So it was a long time ago, it's 2000, but it's kind of a, a good memory. So what you can see here is the potential of adaptive optics. Let me show you, explain it in a few words. So when the light comes from a star, the, front, the wave front is flat okay. because there is no perturbation. When the light crosses the atmosphere, because of the, the atmosphere is not a perfectly homogeneous environment, there is wind there, the, and the, and the dens difference of density, this uh, atmosphere distorts the wavefront. So the final product of this distortion is instead of having a dot when you observe a star, you see this kind of extending blurry feature moving. So what we do with adaptive optics, we separate the light in two sides. One, one side, generally the visible one is going to be used to analyze the distortion. We do that using different kind of technology. And as I say, my talk is not about giving you all the detail of technology, but we use a, what we call a wavefront <coughs> sensor. And the wavefront sensor estimates the distortion. It gives this information to a deformable mirror, to the kind of the mirror, a tip tilt mirror and a deformable mirror. The deformable mirror is basically a mirror made of piezo, made of piezo actuators, which move 200 to 1,000 times per second to compensate this atmospheric turbulence. So it's basically a way to control the atmospheric turbulence and to correct it in real time. The infrared side of the light is sent directly to uh, an infrared camera, a detector. So what you see when you use an adaptive optic system, and that's basically what, that's a, a, a few frames on and off. This is off, and when you close the loop, you basically gather the energy in one coherent peak. It's going to come back, and you can see the airy pattern of the of the adaptive of the of the telescope. You can see the correction is not perfect. There is still some motion because of the, the because of the imperfection of the adaptive optic system. So there is limits, of course, but I'm going to go through that later. I just wanted to say that in 1996 we developed the first adaptive optic system in Europe, it was in fact located in Chile. I came here in 2000 to work with the adaptive optic system at the Keck telescope. The, the Keck telescope is on the top of Mauna Kea. Then we, uh, other eight, 10 meter class telescope had their own adaptive optic system. The very large telescope got his, one, his adaptive optic system called Naos Konica in 2003. And the Gemini North telescope got his adaptive, adaptive optic system in 2005. So this is the limitation of the adaptive optic system. And I'm going to go through that quickly, but I, I want you to get a sense of it. To do this correction, as I say, we do this analysis 1,000 times per second. So we need to have a very bright body, a very bright star, a reference star, we call it. And fortunately, the correction is not perfect. Oh, sorry. And also, the correction doesn't work, works only when the, on axis. Because if you observe a star, this, is a, uh, this, uh, this figure shows this. This is the reference star. If you observe a body slightly offset to the reference star, basically you don't see the same amount of atmosphere. There is an area of the atmosphere that you don't see. Okay? So basically, if you correct the, uh, the uh, atmospheric turbulence, when you go further away from the, from the reference star, the correction is not perfect and degrade with the distance. So there is a small area around the reference star which is a bright target, up to magnitude 14, 15 for most of the natural guy star system, for which we have a good correction. <coughs> we try to find solution to, comp to, uh, to solve this issue. First, the first thing we try to do is to create a faint star in the sky using, using laser guy star, sodium laser guy star. And this fake star is, can be used as a reference. And we put this faint star very close to the target we want to observe, which could be an asteroid, a galaxy, a star, whatever you want. So this increased the sky coverage up to 80%, meaning that we can observe up to 80% of the sky in average. 
So the good news is that this is what we observe when we use a Keck telescope with that adaptive optic system. That's the planet Uranus. And this is what we, what we get when you close the loop. So let me do it again without wave. Okay? So the, you can see visually the, 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 the correction. You can see that with adaptive optic system, you see better. You improve the sharpness of the image because you, you, you get a res an, an observation with a, an angular resolution close to the diffraction limit of the telescope. So we get a resolution. You, you can see details on the surface of the, of the planet, such as the clouds here. And you can see also the small satellites in orbit around the, around the planet. And we also improve in instrumentation. So we improve instrumentation by, by the creation of what we call CCD and infrared detectors, which are capable of take, uh, are very sensitive and capable of, of uh, collecting photons in the visible or in the near infrared or other wavelengths. They're compact, they're numerical. The data come as numbers. So that means we can also use complex uh, algorithm to improve the image. We call that deconvolution. It's been an entire part of my thesis that I'm not even going to show here, which is basically we can take the data and using numerical process, we improve the, the, the image quality. We also use now coronography. So the idea of coronography is to hide the light of the star to be able to see faint features nearby the star. Because most, in most of the case, when we want to observe a planet, an exoplanet, we're not interested in the star itself. We want to see the planets nearby the star. So this is the technology that uh, has been developed uh, since 1984 for um, ground-based telescopes. And the image here is, for instance, the first detection of the ring around uh, uh, the disk around Beta Pictoris. There was a talk last week or two weeks ago by Olivier Guillon specifically on that. And then the, th the third technology development, which is more recent, is what we call integral field unit or integral field spectrograph. And the idea here is to collect an image and a spectra of a body at the same time. So we have a two-dimension, you can see here, we have a two-dimension image. And in the, in the Z ax axis here, you also have a spectra. Okay? And you collect this by once. I mean, you're not throwing away photons because you put a filter on it. You basically collect all the data by one. Once. This is a very opt optimal way of analyzing the light uh, coming from a planet or a star or an asteroid. You have the shape of the body and you also have the surface composition or the temperature of the body. So I'm going to show you a few examples of what we have been doing with adaptive optics. And as I say, this is a kind of re a review. So the, um, we now know that asteroids have moons. And this has been as known since the, since the discovery of dactyl in 1995 by the Galileo spacecraft. But they were lucky enough to discover the first triple asteroid system in 2005, which is 87 Sylvia in the main belt. Since then, we know four of them in the main belt. Yeah, you have them here, and the circle, the green circle here, show basically the position of the moon which was detected. So those are systems with a 200 100 kilometer diameter, large, irregularly shaped asteroid. And orbiting a few hundred kilometers away from the primary, we have a tiny 5 to 15 kilometer moon, a rock ob in orbit around it. Why are they important? Well, because we love to see stuff like we are not expecting. But also because when we study the m this orbit, the orbit of those moons, after a few years, we can even get the composition by the density of the, of the system. And we can also get the interior, constrain the interior of the, pri of the primary. We can see how the material is distributed inside the primary, inside the asteroid itself. And we, have we got some very surprising results. We found out that all of these bodies are what we call rubble pile. They have a low, large portion of void in the interior, up to 30%. And most of them, in fact, for these four of them, are in fact differentiated. They have a core, a nucleus of dense material, and a very fluffy, uh, c um, fluffy layers on the top. We don't know what this fluffy layer is made of. So it's most likely it's not feather. It must be a rock. But what kind of rock, we don't know. And as a another result is the study of the, the monitoring of the volcanic activity on Io. So Io is what we call the volcanic wonderland. 
It's a satellite of Jupiter. It's a, f uh, it's a small body, 1.2 arc seconds. With that adaptive optic system, you will not be capable of seeing details on IO. This picture you, have s you can see here is a real observation of IO taken in 2000, 2001. You can see calderas, the black area, and you can see a bright uh, spot as well. The animation on the bottom, let me show, run it again, is basically the first and only snapshot of the volcanic activity of Io that we, we, we took in 2001. Well, the, the bright features, the bright spots, are in fact active volcanoes. What we see here is the heat coming from the magma on, on the volcano of Io. So why is it interesting to observe Io? Well, sim simply because <coughs> We want to know the interior of Io. We want to know the composition of uh, the interior of Io because we want to understand how this body is formed and how it's involved into the Laplace resonance. And also, these bodies are interesting because we expect to see, uh, by un understanding Io, you could understand Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And if one day we find exomoons around exoplanets, we may see the same kind of bodies. So, understanding Io could be important for us to understand the signal of exomoons the day we will discover them. I also was very lucky, and this is very like, you know, sometimes your career change because you were very lucky, and this is one of those moments. Uh, first time I observed at the Keck telescope, newbie, never been to Hawaii, all excited by Hawaii and by the volcano and being on the top of the Mauna Kea, could barely breathe and so on, you know. This, uh, <laughs> you, uh, you have this moment where you say, okay, let's, uh, we have, 30 minutes of observation. What are we going to do? Well, let's observe Io. So we pawned on Io. That was the f February 20, uh, 20th, 2001. We see the calderas. This is in JHK band between 1 and 2.5 micron. I was not expecting to see anything interesting. Then we observe Io again two days later. The excitement is still here, still Hawaii. I remember we went to, the, we went to see uh, Waikiloa and the bay and the turtles and so on, because we do that too. <laughs> and we observe Io in the, in the evening. Once again, we have 30 minutes to observe Io. We point the telescope on Io, we close the loop, and then suddenly we see this feature which looks like a star. We, take, we, we, think, we look at each other. We are three observers at this time. I did this with Imke de Pater, professor at UC Berkeley. And it took us a while to, think, to find out that the star we were observing was not a star. It was, in fact, a very bright eruption of one of the volcanoes on Io. And as you can see, because we observed two days later, we observed the same, almost the same hemisphere of the, of, of the, of the satellite. So what we've, be, we've basically been witnessing here is the birth of a very, strong, a very powerful eruption on, the, on Io. We knew they existed because some people reported it by in, uh, integrated photometry, photometry by simply looking at the outburst of the change of light. But we didn't know if they were coming from one volcano or from multiple number of volcanoes. And this observation basically showed it was coming from one of them, called CERT 2001. And we did some analysis, and we found out that this was equivalent to the size of Los Angeles in terms of the, tens of the density of the size of the volcano itself. It was covered with magma with a temperature bit, uh, up to 1,400 Kelvin. And this is a comparison with the Etna uh, eruption in 1992. OK, for, uh, using those telescopes, we can monitor uh, volcanic activity as well. So this is an observation of Tivashtar. Tivashtar was uh, observed by the Galileo spacecraft in 1994, 1999. We observed Io again from, from 2001 to 2004. We didn't see much on the, on the surface of uh, Io, specifically in this area. And in 2006, we observed the weakening of this eruption. So in this case, we didn't use only any major, we use an integral field spectrograph. So what you can see here is basically the spectra of the, vol of, um, <laughs> the spectra of the volcanic eruption of the magma, the hot magma coming from, uh, from Tivashtar. This is the location of the eruption that we had, and this is a map of uh, the Galileo made by the, collected by the Galileo space, uh, spacecraft. Something that we this data has been extremely useful to estimate the high temperature of the magma, 1240 Kelvin, implying we have the same kind of volcanic activity that we have on Earth, basaltic lava, at least. 
something we were expecting to see some absorption on the surface of the, of the magma due to, for instance, production of gas, but we didn't see any. So that helped us to constrain the, the interior structure of Io. And this eruption, we monitor it over a long period of time using a large number of different telescopes, Gemini, VLT, and so on. And we found out that it lasted at least 500 days. That's the longest eruption ever observed, outburst eruption ever observed on Io. So Io is full of surprise. And the only way we're going to understand this body is basically by monitoring continuously almost its volcanic activity. OK, so I have 10 minutes, which is absolutely impossible, but I'm going to go <laughs> fast on this one. So uh, you remember I mentioned that with, uh, with adaptive optic system, we can, we can uh, get a very good correction close to the, to the reference star. But this is not true anymore, because now we have some very smart people who invented what we call the MCAO, the multi-conjugate adaptive optic system. And the way you do that is basically by having three reference sensors instead of one. And with this three reference sensor, you can build a 3D shape of that, a 3D map of the turbulence. And you correct this, this uh, 3D map of the turbulence using multiple, multiple uh, deformable mirror. Not one only, but two or three even. And based on this, you have a correction which is almost homogeneous on a larger field of view. So you get rid of the main limitation of adaptive optics. This was Theoretically, uh, the theory of this was published in Nature. And in fact, the first uh, MCAO system was called MAD was installed on the VLT telescopes. And I was lucky to get the first observation, and I think the only observation of Jupiter using this adap adaptive optic system. So this is an observation on the right using MAD, the MCAO system, on the VLT. And on the left, we have an observation using the HST uh, Hubble Space Telescopes. Because we have a larger telescope, we have a better resolution, 0.1 arc seconds, than HST. And because we are using new instruments, we have a larger field of view. So I'm not going to go through the science here, but this kind of data is extremely important to understand the variability of, uh, of the atmosphere of, uh, of Jupiter. OK, so what do I do now? Well, I spend a lot of my time in front of my computer, writing grants and uh, trying to write papers. I collect, I get data also not, I don't have, I don't go always, always to the telescopes anymore because they found out that the most efficient way to get good observation is to have other people doing observation for you, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, we still do some fun stuff. And the fun, the fun stuff is of course to search for exoplanets. So how do we do that? Well, we create new instrument. So I'm part of this team called, of an instrument called GPI the Gemini Planet Imager. So this idea here is to, to build an adaptive optic system specifically dedicated to one science case, which is to search for exoplanets. The way you search for an exoplanet is to basically by reaching a very high contrast close to your, to your star. So here, this is a few stars for which we have seen an exoplanet. So that's Beta Pictoris, and this tiny dot here, it's an exoplanet. And this is uh, Fomaro. And that tiny dot here, that you have a zoom here, is one of the exoplanets. This is HST observation, and this is VLT observation. So what we want now is to detect what we call safe, luminous, young, Jupiter-like exoplanets. Jupiter planets, which are very young, so they're bright enough to be detected with adaptive optic systems. Where, could you say where the exoplanet is in the blue image again? It's here. See this tiny dot here? And the reason for which we know it's an exoplanet is because we could see it moving. We have various observations. This, I'm not involved in this one, but they have uh, taken observation at different epochs, and they know now kind of uh, the orbit. So how you do this GPI? But first, you write a grant proposal to get funding to do this. <laughs> and when we have the money, you kind of be trying to be imaginative. And the you do that, you basically by build an extreme adaptive optic system. So something, an, is, an instrument which has a correct in real time and very well the atmospheric turbulences, but you also uh, use an inter integral fit spectrograph and you had coronographic, cap co coronographic capabilities. Could, the you, could you also just tell us what can we tell about that exoplanet? So when you see an exoplanet like this, and that's the, the when you use an integral fit spectrograph, for instance, you get a spectra. 
Okay? So in the case of G pi, we're going to get a spectral resolution of 45 so between uh, 0.8 to 2.5 micron. So we're going to be capable of detecting uh, the temperature first and also some absorption burn due to specific gas on the surf uh, on the surf on the in the atmosphere in the upper atmosphere of the planet so we from this data we could use, for instance de derive the composition of the of the exoplanet <coughs> derive its age as well and compare the age of this exoplanet with the age of the of the star uh, one another secondary goal is to have uh, to also see disks and the interaction between the s the planets and the disk uh, uh, the disk and also the structure in the disk. So our goal is to, with this kind of project, is to basically be able to tell you in the future if there is exoplanets around bright stars that you can see with naked eye. Because the targets we have, we could observe here, are, are stars that you will be able to see with your eyes. So we'll be able to tell you there is, planets, there is a planet around this very bright star in the sky. So the project started in 2005. We did the integration at UC Santa Cruz between 2012 and 2013. And this is uh, basically the instrument mounted at UC Santa Cruz. This is my student, Jean-Baptiste, who is here. And this is his last day at the SETI Institute. Thank you. <laughs> I told you I will embarrass you in front of everybody. <laughs> so what you have here, it's a simulation of an observation. So the blink. The, uh, this is a planet, in fact, located nearby, uh, nearby this bright star. And the reason for which this planet disappears is basically because we're entering what we call the methane band. So the planet, the methane of the, on the top atmosphere of the planet absorbs the light, coming, uh, absorb the light and you don't, you don't see the planet anymore. So the instrument has just been shipped to Chile, and in fact it just arrived at the observatory. And we expect to have the first, the first light at the end of 2014 or beginning of 2014. Okay, so I hope you like acronyms because that's what we use a lot in adaptive optics, with adaptive optics technology. And frankly, I have a hard time to remember all of them, so that's why I write them on, on the small in, my, in the side here. So this is the flavor of adaptive optics. Um, what I show you so far is what we call the single conjugate adaptive optic system. These, the one with natural guy star and the laser guy star. What I, we are cr building with GPI, sorry, is what we call extreme adaptive optic system. So this diagram shows you the performance on the y-axis versus the field of view. So what we are doing now is in fact to, do, to develop new adaptive optic system. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but one of them is for instance at Magellan and MMT. They're developing what we call adaptive optic system on the secondary mirror. So instead of having a tiny mirror correcting the atmospheric turbulence of the coming from the atmosphere, we basically use the secondary mirror itself to correct the atmospheric turbulence. This is way more efficient because we get rid of the uh, we we correct we better correct the aberration, so we get a better system with a better performance, up to 80 percent. The green box here corresponds to what HST is currently capable of doing. We get an excellent correction on the field of view between 20 to one, or two arc minute, uh, one to two arc minutes. So the game right now is to develop adaptive optic systems such as the Keck and GAO, uh, capable of um, competing with HST, or even getting a better resolution. But there is other technology, and I could not avoid to talk about this one, if, even if I'm remotely involved with it. So I'm going to just be, give you a brief overview as we call interferometry. This is an example of an interferometer. The European Southern Observatory built a VLT on the top of the, of the Paranal in Chile. The VLT is composed of four eight meter class telescope and four, this is a typo, 1.4 meter auxiliary telescopes. So this is the eight meter class telescopes. And you see there is this kind of tunnel here, where in fact light can travel. And what they do, they use this auxiliary telescope at different position. All these telescopes will be or now are capable of observing the same target okay, at the same time. And by combining the light in, this, in the central point of this tunnel and compensating from the, from the distance using delay line, they basically are 
uh, they will basically have a virtual observatory, a vir virtual telescope with a, a res power resolution of equivalent to a, t a telescope of 140 kilometers. So close to the milli arc second. Okay? So this basically the idea is to compense, to collect together the light of, uh, of telescope at the same time to build um, a virtual telescope. So this is not really my field, but I'm just going to give you a few, num a few numbers. We, at the VLT, there is one of these interferometers. In the US, there is like a few of them, four of them. None of them has been built yet in space. What you need to know is that these instruments are not yet very sensitive for various reasons which are mostly technological. And we don't have uh, images yet. We don't have a lot of images. The reason for which we don't have a lot of images is because to have an image, we basically need to have a large number of bases, a large number of telescope. Of, of, of telescope. But the more bases you have, the less light you get. It's a compli complication of the interferometry. But there is a few of them. And this is one of them. It's uh, a system uh, uh, <coughs> uh, epsilon origa B and A. It's basically a large star with a companion in orbit, which is very young. And there is a disk uh, of accretion in orbit around it. This is an artistic view of the system. And this is the reality using interferometry. What you can see is basically the system is in orbit around the center of mass. And you can see the companion with the disk of, um, of dust and, and gas occulting slowly the, the, the star. So using this instrument, you can reach, let me read that, you can reach a resolution of one milli arc second. So you can see small details. And the goal of this instrument is to basically be able to, ex to detect exoplanets, see the exoplanet themselves, or detect the motion of the star due to the exoplanet in orbit around it. We're not yet there where we are going, we're going to be close. So what's the future in, our, in, a, in the field of uh, planetary astronomy? Well, I don't really know, but I'm going to give you a few uh, ideas. And I have one minute of to, to do that, so I'm going to go fast. <laughs> so first of all, I think it's important to know that astronomy will change significantly in the future because of the arrival of this large survey such as LSST, which is an eight meter class telescope, which is gonna map the entire sky several, several times per week, or PENSTAR, which is already in operation. Using this survey telescope, we're gonna gather a large amount of data. Okay, we're gonna be able to see faint objects up to magnitude 22.5, so very faint, in fact, cap barely cap at the limit of the capability of the eight meter class telescope we have currently. So we will be a detect a large number of, we will collect a large number of data, and we expect to have to basically in, term in, the t in for planetary science to detect a large number of asteroids, small solar system bodies. So astronomy will change simply because we, gonna, we, have going, we are going to have so, so much data that we will have to basically get more organized and know what uh, and develop a smart algorithm to be able to know when something interesting appears in the sky. And I think this is an important change in the way we're doing astronomy. So maybe in the future, astronomers will be people with iPhone, and they will be basically receive their, on, this, on their phone, iPhone or whatever brand you want, some alert message, messages when there is something interesting appearing in the sky, a transient event, a supernovae, but also um, a specific, an asteroid with a very specific orbit. Astronomy will change also because now we're thinking about building bigger telescopes. Eight, ten meter is not enough. We want to build larger telescopes, larger aperture. There is three main projects in competition. The 30 meter telescope, which will be built in Hawaii, built in Hawaii. The European Extremely Large Telescope in Chile, which is a 40 meter class telescope. And the giant... J? 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 Yeah. yeah, thank you. <laughs> I never know this one. Also in Chile, a 24.5. So we can talk about it, but I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you this simulation, which I think is more interesting because it illustrates clearly what we're going to do with these uh, these telescopes when they will be equipped with adaptive optic system. On the left, you have an observation with the Keck telescope. In the middle, you have an observation with an extreme adaptive optic system on the Keck telescope, and on the right, you have an observation of Io again, but this time with the TMT. 
Okay, so you can see the improvement in the resolution. You can see that we can we see details on the surface, and you can even see a small hotspot like A and B here that are not visible, for instance, with the K current KKO system. So there is an improvement in resolution and in sensitivity. And this is a comparison with what we get we got using the Galileo spacecraft. The global data coming from uh, the billion dollar spacecraft in orbit around Jupiter between 1995 and 2000. So this is, at the, the image in the middle is basically at the same wavelength range than what we have on the right. So we have the same um, resolution that we, what we, we get with the Galileo spacecraft. So we, you, we, with this large telescope, we will also be able to observe small, uh, a large number of small solar system bodies. But the most interesting one, I think, for the future is, of course, the observation of what, what we call a trans Neptunian object. This is a complex slide, but what I just want to say here is that using the TMT, for instance, because I did the simulation for the TMT, we'll be able to resolve, to see the, um, the shape of this trans Neptunian object, to see features on the surface. This is kind of a, an equivalent of an observation of Pluto, the dwarf planet Pluto, using the TMT. We will see a, we'll be able to see the shape, to see features on the surface, characterize the surface of the, of the trans Neptunian object. So are we still you go going through this idea that we need to buy bigger and telescope, higher telescope, and then more expensive telescope? I think we are going through that, but we may change our mind soon. Let me see. So this is an interesting table showing you the kind of price tag of uh, those projects. So the VLT costs $500 million, roughly. The HST is larger, than, it costs more than $6 billion, but it's been in operation since, since 1990. But right now we are building telescopes such as the James Webb Space Telescope, which, is, which will cost $8 billion and will be launched in 2018, if everything works fine. There is also the idea of building a replacement for, the, for HST, which we call ATLAS, the 8-meter class telescope folded as well. Why do we build these uh, this new space telescopes? We could ask, why do we build this knowing that with adaptive optics on the 8, 10 meter class telescope, we have a better resolution than HST. And with the extremely large telescopes, we have a better resolution than the JWST or ATLAS, because they're 30, 40 meter size in aperture. Well, because, and that's a debate in our community, with this space telescope, we have access to UV and mid-infrared. We have a better sensibility, sensitivity. And also because what drives this, uh, this large telescope is not planetary science. The driver here is cosmology, understanding the structure of the universe. And for that, for that, you need an extremely sensitive instrument with a large field of view. And that's only possible from, from space for the moment. Adaptive optics cannot compete with uh, ATLAS, uh, for instance. But there is a niche project for planetary scientists, and I think the niche, pro niche project is to basically develop sp small space telescope dedicated to a few or one planetary science driver. And that's what I'm trying to advocate for in the, the past uh, two years. So we have a few examples. Kepler is one of them. One science, science case, search for Earth-like, uh, Earth-size exoplanet and do a statistical uh, su survey of this uh, planet. There is a new one coming test, and we have different new projects. I mean, there is KOPS, which, will be, uh, which is proposed by, uh, which has been just accepted by ESA, which will basically do the same than TESS. Um, and then we have also this idea of having what we call nanosatellites, uh, small satellites in orbit, um, small satellite using S sorry, small telescope on board nanosat nanosatellites. Let me show you one of, the, one of the few crazy ideas I'm having right now. It's basically to develop what we call an origami nanosat. It's an encapsulated, deployable 0.5 to 1 meter telescope in a small container, a small nanosat. It looks crazy, but if you don't think crazy, <laughs> we're going to stay, well, we're going to start, we're going to build bigger and bigger telescope and more expensive. These are very cheap. There is a lot of technological challenges, of course, because we don't know yet how to do those, those small apertures, how to deploy them. And the reason for which I'm interested in that is simply because after you deploy them, 
you basically have to correct from the, from the aberration due to the fact that we have a thin membrane. And basically, adaptive optics that we have been using on the ground will be used in the sky here to correct not for the ad atmospheric turbulence, but to correct from the aberration due to the motion and the deformation of the membrane. So it's the same technology. So basically, this will work as soon as we can put adaptive optics in space. So we break, we, we, I think we broke the thin barrier. We broke through, in fact. This is a summary of, uh, of, um, of my talk. We started with a resolution of 70 arc seconds with naked eyes in 1960, uh, 1600, sorry. Then we invented uh, uh, telescopes. We uh, climbed the mountain to the, the Californian building, Californian observatories, then Hawaiian and Chilean observatories. Uh, then we built the Hubble Space Telescope here. Using VLT, we basically get a resolution of uh, one milli arc seconds. Right now, what we are doing is to envision projects such as the TMT to reach a resolution of a few arc, sec uh, a few arc seconds, five to seven mi uh, arc, uh, five, sorry, a few milli arc seconds, five to seven milli arc seconds. <coughs> so what will be the future, the far and the distant future? Okay, let's finish with that. The far and distance future is maybe to have a, what we call a space inf inter interferometer. That's a crazy idea, but that's been proposed for a long time. It's been proposed like uh, already uh, in 2005 to build an array of small telescopes, combine the light from this small telescope to, be, to, to, have, a, um, to have a telescope, a virtual of, uh, of a telescope of 200 meter in ba baseline. If you pl place this in space, you have the sensitivity necessary to detect biosignature, okay, around the biosignature and, de such a, and detect, for instance, um, Earth-like planet. Uh, this year, I've participated in this roadmap for the next 30 years of astrophysics. And this idea came back. And it came back with a big and very grandiose and ambitious plan of having the same kind of concept, but with baseline of 30 kilometers. As I say, interferometry is not my field, but this person, uh, his name is Renard from the Goddard Observatory, showed this slide that I think you, had to s you, you, should, s you should think about, which basically show what will be the resolution, what, we, uh, what will be, be basically an image of an Earth-like planet observed using a 30 kilometer baseline interferometer. That's the image, the image on the right. You will be able to see an Earth-like planet um, and get 16 elements of resolution if this planet is located at 15 light years. And I will end here saying that, uh, thanking you for your time and so being sorry for being so long. I will just say that we're starting with a few centimeter telescope, which was polished by hand. And now we are thinking about building network of space telescopes separated by kilometers in distance to measure Earth-like planet. And, um, one of, the re one of the reasons I work at the SETI Institute is because I think those instruments are the ones which are most likely to detect life in our galaxy. And that's all. Thank you. Um, uh, put your hand up and I'll, I'll get, get around to you. Um, uh, Frank, um, my question <coughs> comes from the, uh, the, the graph that you showed with the uh, Hubble Space Telescope uh, rectangle, um, the X and Y axes. Can you go back and show us where JWST will fit on that graph? This? No, 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 back, 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 sorry. Okay. Sorry. Which graph? Um, <coughs> the one where you showed. Um, this one? Yeah, that one. Well, JWST will have a field of view of uh, 10 arc minutes. And uh, the performance, this is not the resolution. It's basically the performance. So it will be here. It will be in this area. Most likely, it will go all the way here because, uh, yeah, we have a na narrower field of view. So it will be in this area. But it will not be, it will not be capable of doing as close as, uh, as adapt extreme adaptive optic systems. Hi. So when you were having your uh, discussion about wild and crazy telescope concepts of the future, 
Did putting a telescope on the far side of the moon come up? No. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> because of the dust. Oh. I have this idea, in fact, like f five years ago, and I even wanted to propose a project, and basically someone told me, you don't think about it, because the dust is going to be the main issue you have here. And we don't really understand how the m dust is moving on the top of that. Like it's uh, the dust on the surface, the regolith, we don't say dust because we are scientists, we can say regolith, <laughs> <laughs> is moving due to electrostatic forces and the change of illumination and so on. So we don't really know how we are going to be able to, uh, to build something on the moon that will stay isolated enough to be able to do a good imaging. Frank? Jill, oh. um, will, GP, <coughs> will GPI be able to follow up on the test exoplanets, or are those sources too weak? Too the tests, tests will observe, uh, will detect transit planet, and uh, GPI will de in, will detect planets which are f distant from the star and face most likely face on system. So that's kind of they are kind of complementary in a way. It's too bad. So too bad, yes. Yeah. But the next generation, something I did not say, that for the extremely large telescopes, there is, in fact, uh, uh, an overlap between TESS and uh, extremely large telescope. Uh, GPI, there, is a GPI there is an idea of having a GPI system for um, a GPI instrument for the extremely large telescope okay. and the second generation. And in this case, there will be overlap between these two, uh, these okay. two populations. And for the um, optical interferometers that you're talking about, those are all amplitude only, right? You, you can't get phase information. Uh, I can answer to this, in fact. Um, with interferometry, haven't we? I it could have been a proposal. Haven't we done where we have one telescope in space and then use some telescopes on the Earth? And, uh, or, and I know we have the worldwide no, inferometry, inferometer that we use many, all the radio telescopes. We cannot do that with uh, optical telescopes. Uh, so it's only radio. Yes, yeah, only We've radio. We've done it with radio. Okay. One idea is to, uh, to use fibers. And this has been done at Mauna Kea. It's called the OANA project. And in this case, what I want to do is to, bu uh, is to connect all these large telescopes, these eight meter class telescopes, on the top of Mauna Kea using an array of fibers. And that will be an equivalent of a few kilometer in diameter telescope. Mm -hmm. The prototype was, was built and uh, tested, but uh, they, uh, they did not pursue for some uh, reason, which most likely have financial reasons. I can I can do the microphone sure, too. Yeah, uh, <laughs> put your hands down to the tree and cross you. So my understanding from other talks is that adaptive optics works well with longer wavelengths, but at least so far uh, is not feasible in the optical range. Can you comment on you know futures moving forward in that space? That's true. Um, <coughs> The NGAO, the Keck NGAO, which is here, called LTAO, which is Laser Tomography Adaptive Optics, it's basically an, uh, an adaptive optic system which will have um, an ast asterism of laser guy star, five of them, and that will allow to get a very good correction, 80% in K-band, and the predictions say that we get 20% in uh, R-band, in a red. So that's the limit we have so far. There is no adaptive optic system capable yet of observing at shorter wavelength than uh, 0.8, 0.9. The future say we could reach 0.7. And there is, I think there is no science driver to go to, go to shorter wavelength, in fact. So no science driver for yeah. optical. That's one, uh, this figure I show you here, it's a result of a long discussion. They lock us in the, in the room in Victoria. <laughs> and uh, they basically invited planetary scientists, stellar and people, galaxy <coughs> cosmology. And we had a huge discussion about what kind of adaptive optics we want. And this came out, basically, as a kind of a result. You can, on the right, MOAO, GLO is what cosmologists want. On the left is what everybody else wants. <laughs> so how many of them, how many people do you have? 
Oh. There is much more cosmologists and extragalactic than there is planetary scientists, unfortunately. Other questions? Okay. Questions? Okay. <coughs> ah, I'm going to have my present. <laughs> um, Frank, I noticed in um, some of your... Yeah, uh, I forgot to mention that, so it's good you remind me. Yeah, some of your pictures have a little mug in them. Um, this could be the mug that, that's in those pictures of you. Uh, um, Thank it's, you. Uh, it's a SETI uh, dot org slash talks uh, image on there, the second to give a, for us to give away. So Thank you. Um, please join me in thanking Frank for his great talk. Yeah, I would like to mention that Daniel Fuzela did mo uh, some of the illustration of this talk, and she's the one who did as well this uh, right. picture. So she's looking at me right now. Thank you. Risk.